You know, we were saying it last time. They're like, when I grow up, I was like, bitch, you grown at this you point. Like, you you did grow up, honey child. Like, <laughs> Matilda's like 20 and she's like moving the chalk. And I'm like, this is bone chilling. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of Stage Door Medium. I'm your host, Jimmy. Thank you for coming by today. If you're new to the podcast, which I'm guessing some of you might be because of our guest today, um, essentially it's a podcast where I sit down with uh, Broadway artists that I've had the pleasure of reading. Uh, if you don't know, I've been a practicing medium for just about the last 10 years. So long story short, I ended up uh, reading some Broadway actors and from there it just kind of snowballed. So when the pandemic hit, I started a podcast where I sit down with these incredible artists who are just not only the hardest working, but just kind and, 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 and just incredible. And we talk about the parallels between energy and artistry. And um, so we've got a real great guest today that I, I pinched myself. I looked at the calendar. I was like, oh, I remembered. So um, before, before I introduce them, a question that I got that I thought was fascinating about, about mediumship. And I actually have a really fresh story to tell you about it because it just happened last night. So question I got was the person when I when I had seen a medium before the person that I most wanted to come through during the reading did not why did that happen if I go to another medium do you think that they would come through it's such a good question so I'm going to try to answer it as best as I can because I think it will vary based on the medium the first thing that I want to dispel though is the bullshit answer that there's still acclimating to the other side i've heard like a british medium do this before and she's like oh love he's still adjusting you know he's still in the transition period getting his sea legs and i'm like that is the biggest crock of shit that i've, I've ever heard and um the woman's like well he's been gone a year now she's like it's usually about a year and a half two years and then come back and i'm like i will tell you and i don't mean this rudely most likely because it happens sometimes we miss folks during a reading I'm going to take a liberty and say most likely that medium just might not have sensed them. So what happens is if this does happen, it could, or if they're genuinely not there, it's happened to me before, where at the end, I always say, if somebody didn't come through, you can ask, you can say, hi, would you be able to tell me a little bit of information about this soul? I might ask you for just a connecting name or the relationship to you. That way it doesn't feel like guesswork, because if I didn't get them yet, I don't want to ask you a million questions and it feel not feel valid. So I might just say, hey, do you have a name or who's the relationship to you? Every so often, if I see a sign that would be put on a hotel door, like out to lunch or like um, service requested, it means that they're not there anymore. It means that they've chosen to come back and uh, reincarnate again to learn more lessons. It's not that common though. Um, typically we, we wait and come back as an entire family unit. So if they don't come through. You are more than welcome to ask, and we will try our best. Last night, really quick, and then I'm going to introduce our guest. I'm still, I woke up about it, still thinking about it. So I, I had a ticketed event last night where, um, uh, at this gorgeous lavender farmstead. So it was so crazy. It was sold out. I was so excited. And I, I had one, I was like, you know what? I'm going to bring through one more soul. And I start doing a pan and I'm like, I have no clue who's going to come through, but something started feeling funny up here for me. Just like a, almost like a don't fuck this up type of vibe. So I turn and I hear stop and I'm looking dead at this girl who's probably 25 years old. And immediately I just hear, I want to talk to my girl. So you have to understand as a medium, that could mean several things. If we're not being shown, it could mean I want to talk to my girlfriend. I want to talk to my daughter. One of those two. So that's where our clear cognizance kicks in. So if you've been listening, that means clear knowing. And I just went, Dad. So uh, I was like, Do you mind if I speak to you about the the, the parent that's in spirit? I'm like, assuming I'm assuming this is Dad. And um, sure enough, it, it was. And um, I was like, It's really weird. I I was told to stop right at you. And she was like, What's crazy is that 20 seconds before you called on me, I told him 
if you don't come through as the final one, I will be so mad. And so I am a firm believer in intention. And what's crazy is that the spirit showed me the image of a, of a wedding ring and I saw balloons and I said, do you have some exciting news to share? I said about a ring and she started crying and she says, I, I get married next week. And I was really hoping that my dad would be here to offer me some advice. So I was a mess at this point. So literally what you can do if you want to make sure is sometimes people view mediumship as this passive process where we just go in and they like pull energy off of us like a dementor or something, which isn't like that. Um, it's very much an active two-way process. So tell them before you go into a reading, hi, I just want to make sure that you're going to be home that day and you don't have anything else going on. Can you please come through? So that's my two cents on that. I'm so excited. Our guests today, I, I, I have such a talent crush on them. And now just a human crush. And they are just, just good people. And so Broadway credits, they made their Broadway debut in Matilda. And then, but before that, though, they won the Olivier Award for Zorro. Uh, then they made their Broadway debut in Matilda. Then went across the street to Dames at Sea and then came back to Matilda to close the Broadway production. Countless film and TV shows. Emoji Land off Broadway, the one woman show of, um, oh my goodness, um, um, Who's Holiday? Please help me in welcoming the incredible Leslie Margarita to our show today. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> How are you? I hate you. I'm so good. I, I, I always tune out when, when the intros are done because I, I just, I, it's so weird. I hate hearing like, here's what she's done and blah, 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 blah. I don't know. It's always so icky to me. I was just watching um, Mondays with Mindy. And yes, Mindy Cohn from The Facts of Life. And they were introducing, like, I want to say it was Tootie or whoever played Tootie or Joe. But the bio was like three pages long. And I was like, this is a little awkward. I'm like, can we, can we, like, I was like, it it literally felt like a Wikipedia rap sheet. I was like, so I'm like, I'm going to keep it brief. Yeah, great. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, What have you been up to since, since, well, no, no, I don't want to say since the pandemic because we're moving out of that. I want to think positively, but I guess what mm-hmm. have you been up to? What's what's new? Oh my gosh, so much. I'm out here in LA, which is, I, I go back and forth between New York and LA. And so uh, stuff's kind of been opening up here, which is nice. I saw Disney I mean, World. You're skinny. It, dis, I went to Disneyland. Oh, Disneyland, excuse me, yes. Yeah, Disneyland, which is amazing and so fun. Um, you know, I figure skate as my hobby. So I've been figure skating a ton. And then I've been doing work too. I've been working on an animated series and I'm going to Cape Cod in in a few weeks to do um, a production of Songs for a New World, which is um, really, really exciting because I've never gotten to sing those songs. Which, which can I ask, um, which, which track are you? I'm the, the Surabaya Santa and Stars and Moon. Stars and the Moon. Yeah. (laughs) I can't wait. I'm so excited. I've never been to Cape Cod. So that's going to be very exciting. Jason Robert Brown is a friend of mine. Jason Robert Brown wrote the music, obviously. Um, And he's a friend of mine and has been for years, but I've never, ever sung any of his songs. And so this will be the first time. And I'm really, really excited. I know. I'm really excited. And it's Cape Cod. So poor Leslie. I know, right? They literally, I've never been. And and I they said, do you want to spend three weeks in Cape Cod singing Jason Robert Brown? And I was like, I love my life. Yeah. We are doing, they built a brand new outdoor theater. So we are doing it outdoors, which will be pretty amazing. Yeah. To sing, you know, Stars and the Moon. And, and I'm actually looking at Stars and the Moon. It will be pretty amazing. Oh my God. Um, yeah, so it's it's a brand new space that they've built, um, and I think we'll keep uh, post all of this. But yeah, so work's coming back, and and I've been so lucky to be busy during all of this. But but life is good too. I've been really enjoying Los Angeles and and being home with yeah. my husband and my dog, and it's been great. Yeah. It's funny. I knew deep down in my gut that. W- I don't know how to describe it. I knew that we were going to meet one day. I was like, I think I'm going to read her one day. And it wasn't, and we'll get to that later. It wasn't like a manifestation type of thing, but there were so many, I don't know how to describe it. And then six degrees of separation. I remember right before the shutdown, we were getting our wigs from Bobby pins for Matilda. And he sent me a photo of Amanda Thripp's wig and it was on your wig head. And so I showed it to a couple of my students and they like just about like 
they like freaked out. It was like when the Pope's trying to like touch the baby, like, or, you know, they're holding the babies to the Pope. They were all trying to like touch the phone to like soak up the goodness of like your name on a goddamn wig head. Like they couldn't handle it. So much. So I I was like, that makes me feel so great. That's amazing. It was, it was really cool. And you know, I, I'd seen you a couple times in Matilda and it's funny to go back to that opening question that I had, I, I had been asked. I kind of liken it to that of seeing a show where you don't know sometimes who's going to be on that call board uh, until you get into the, the Schubert. And, you know, it's, I remember I was like, Oh, I want to see Alison Luff. And I was so ticked because I got to the call board and hers was the name that was out that day. And, you know, to, to piggyback off that question, no matter what, someone is going to give you the answer in a reading. Someone's going to tell that story just as well as Alison Luff would. And so it all works out. So now we're here. Yeah. It does. Um, it does. Well, question for you. How did, did you, I guess, before we dive into it, did you always know that, that you were going to do this and be and yes. perform? Like how early? I did. I did. I would say eight. I, uh, I don't remember much. I remember dancing. I loved to dance. And my mom was a dancer and I had so much nervous energy that they decided to put me into dance to calm me down. And I just took to it. And my ballet teacher ran a community theater and she was like we need uh you know dancers to play boys in oliver mm-hmm. and i was like eight and and auditioned and had never sung and I remember i remember very vividly singing happy birthday and going ah there's there's i had a huge voice it, i have the exact same voice now that i did <laughs> when I was eight. huge loud not always pretty, but it was just like what <laughs> I was given. And I, I did that show, Oliver, and then I, I started doing community theater and I just, it was a no brainer from them. I, I, I completely 100% knew I would be doing this. I never thought about doing anything else. My parents never thought about me doing anything else. And I'm, I'm the youngest of four and there were no other performers in the family. Um, but my, there was just never a question. And, and I think, I think that, and we'll obviously we'll talk about manifesting and things. I think yeah. that had a huge impact on, on my trajectory. It didn't go the way I planned, but it, I always knew I would do this. Always, always, always. Well, it's funny you say that too, because I was just telling the, the folks last night at the event that, and it sounds so corny, I started crying on the drive home thinking about it because I always knew as a kid, I always said I wanted to work with, I wanted to be on Broadway and work with Broadway actors. But then I was like, I want to be a therapist. I want to help people. And then I, long story short, I I went to college for teaching and I was like, do I minor in theater? But I don't think I was brave enough to be honest because I think there's so much courage that comes with pursuing this. And so long story short, I went for education but now you, you just have to laugh at how the universe puts things in your path. And like now I literally have like my dream job. Like I get to sit with Broadway artists whose work I have admired and now like and know that I'm, I'm, I'm doing some small part to help them find closure or like it is the craziest. Yeah. That's why I always tell my students and just be open to whatever you know whatever wins the that you know the direction that that your life could go in and it will turn out exactly as as need be and oh yeah you um, have to trust that path you have to trust that path and it's it's difficult it is difficult and i'm sure we'll get into it but but because it's a double-edged sword knowing exactly what i wanted to do my entire life and then when you don't get to do that it's very difficult to reconcile why isn't happening? I know exactly what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm, I'm not being allowed to do it. Or it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It's, it's very, it's so it's not always, my husband always says like, it's very cool that you knew what you wanted to do your entire life. That's such a gift. And I was like, it is, but it's also not a gift. It's also. <laughs> well, you, oh my God, you said it best because it's this idea of, I, I'm going to be very honest in my line of work. If I am, and I would imagine that this, the temptation of that mentality has got to be there for you. If I am not doing good work, I will not continue to get work. 
So for uh-huh. me, and I, I don't know, uh, there's days I, I also chalk it up as like spirit is my equivalent of like your agent. So if I'm, if I, let's say I did a shitty job, they're not going to be being, I, I say that they're like the operators and the switchboard, like they're not going to be sending people my way if I'm not doing a good yeah. job. And I would imagine in the arts, it's got to be so difficult because it's saturated with so many incredible performers. But then we have this idea of, oh, I didn't get the work. So am I not doing a good job where it's not the case there? But Correct. what a mind, you know, a hundred percent. Yes, it, it's, it is a lifelong. Yeah. And, and for me, when I, there were also times so when I wasn't getting work, when I would direct the musical every year and I would go, oh gosh, I must be doing something wrong. And then yeah. I stepped back and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm literally sinking every evening into directing this show. I'm like, that's their way of just turning the light off. You know, and then sure enough, the musical would end the next day. I shit you not. It would be like, bloop, 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 like, hi, I'm looking for a reading. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I get it. So mm-hmm. question that was asked for both of us to answer. Um, one thing that would surprise people to know about you or one misconception? Oh my gosh. Surprised. Oh, well, I think people are always surprised to hear that I, um, have relatively low self-esteem and am not as brave as I uh, come off to be on social media. I, 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 I often remind the theater kids, I don't have it figured out. And, and I'm very, very open on social media. So I'm always surprised when, when or not surprised, I'm, I think people are surprised to hear that I have the same anxieties that they do. I still have panic attacks about my work. And, but, you know, I think, I think people are surprised about that. I saw the beautiful letter that you wrote um, that's on your website and I was reading it today, soaking it up. I, I, it's, it's so raw and honest and I'm, I'm such a advocate of transparency and I wish in every field, like I tell folks all the time, like, I don't see spirit like I see you. I don't hear them like I hear you. I don't, I think there's, I'm, it's not always on. And I think you get these things that you, what you're not seeing on television or what you're not seeing when you see a performance, you're not seeing the edit, you know, you're not seeing, or the, 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 what's going on backstage. And, you know, you're seeing these mediums get every iota of information correct when truthfully, they probably already done five takes. You know what I mean? So I think that's one misconception for mediumship. I think the other is just, I think they take, I think they mistake all mediums as these like very passive hippie um, that we can't swear. I have the dirtiest mouth outside of readings. You know, if like (laughs) yesterday somebody like cut me off and I was like, you fucking fuckhead, like flipping them off. And then I'm like, I'm sending you love and light. And, And, but for me, I just go, okay. Like, and it's not phony. Either part is not phony. It's just. I know when I, you know what, I know when I have to tap into mediumship and like how seriously I take that. And if somebody cuts me off, yeah, that's going to warrant me calling you an asshole and flipping you off and praying that you're not violent and chase me down. I mean, you're like the spiritually perfect person. Oh, they, they really do think like one time somebody tried to like touch me after the reading. They're like, the gift, can I touch you? I was like, please don't do that. This was very creepy. So I think when they, you know, last night I dropped a couple F-bombs at one point and uh, people are like this because I think they're expecting, like, I don't know what they're expecting, but I'm like, here I am. Here uh, it is. So, goodness, I, I guess one of the things that we talked about before we started recording was, and I can see it within both of our, our lines of work, is this dealing with, like, heavy topics and, like, how equipped are we to actually deal with the heaviness. So can I have to, I got to ask your fan base. And I mean, was it predominantly built by Matilda? Would you say? Yes. Uh, built by Matilda, but really built. I did a series of vlogs from Broadway.com. Yeah. And honestly, that fandom was really built on those vlogs because I, um, edited them my, myself and, and was very me on them. And I think that's what connected with people. And so it was, but, but yes, Matilda was definitely like what 
bought these the amazing fans. Do you find a lot of them, and obviously just for accessibility reasons, do you find that many of them might not have even seen you on stage in Matilda? Yes. I was wondering that. So many. Um, and so many, you know, that they, they see uh, bootlegs, which is a bummer, but if that's the only way you can see it, then I get it. Um, but a lot of them were just fans of the vlogs that couldn't get to New York or couldn't yeah. get to the show. And so, yeah, a lot of them hadn't, hadn't seen me live yeah. in the show. Do you, I, I just think of Matilda because it deals with such, I hope I'm wrong, but my gut's telling me to say yes, or that I'm with Matilda dealing with like such heavy topics of like parents that do not appreciate a child. Were you ever getting like heavy stuff in DMS? Like my mom is like a real life Mrs. Warren. Like, did you ever get stuff like that at the stage door or DM? I did. Um, you know, the, the, I talk about this in actually my cabaret show about the, the family that was created on social media fans of Matilda fans of mine that kind of came together because this show hit them in a specific way in, a, in, in whatever that was. And these social media groups started forming friends and I loved that, but yes, I would get things. And it's quite often at the stage door where a fan will kind of unload on you because they feel like they've, they've been got one-on-one -on -one time and it's very difficult because it does hit them. And, and what was interesting to me is that if they said, like, I have a parent that's like Mrs. Wormwood, and what I did feel was through me, at least it was made funny. And through me, because they felt that they knew me from the blogs, it somehow made it more palatable to them in a weird, in a weird way. And I took that responsibility so seriously. And I took the responsibility of I'm telling this story of a, a horrible woman. And if you want to tell me the story of your horrible parent, I'm going to listen. And, and it, it, it was a little heavy on me at times because I, I stage door every night that I can and I will talk to everybody. And it, it is often to the detriment of me because I'll spend a lot of time. And I know that you, you have the same thing. It's that people will feel like they can unload on you and they can because I'm open, but it, it did, I bring that home with me and I, I feel for these people. And so it, it wasn't, you know, I, and I, I don't, um, I, I don't judge anyone who doesn't stay sure because it is, it's a whole thing in, in itself of, cause I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, I don't have the answer. Like I saying, I don't have all the answers. So when I have someone coming to me going, my parent doesn't support me and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. I don't know what that is because I'm playing a character that is that. I myself had incredible parents. Same here. And so I, I don't want to give them advice. But yeah, it was it was definitely, um, I still yeah, always get DMs and things asking questions. And I try, I try to get advice, but it it's always in my head. Like, I hope you know, do as I say, not as I do. Like, I hope that they don't, they take my advice with a grain yeah. of salt because that's what it is. It's just my opinion. Um, and I feel like my message that I give people through my social media and through my cabaret show is about being yourself and, and, and ruling your little kingdom, which is why I call myself queen. And, yeah. you know, I, I hope that that sticks, but I hope that also they make it work for them. I hope that they don't take everything I say to heart because I really don't know. I just know what has worked for me. And if anything, gosh, I mean, what I, I think is so powerful about the message of Matilda is that she's she's not a victim. She doesn't take the victim mm -hmm. status. If there is a takeaway from the show, it's like, okay, you are in charge of your destiny. Yes. And I, I sat down with my students and, you know, when we, when we first read through the show, and I was like, what's the message of this show? And how do you see it? Because I'm so interested in like, I'm very proud to say that I directed it with actual like, eight to 10 year olds in those, in those kids yeah. tracks and their takeaway, their vantage point was, you know, you have some of, Oh, I don't want to like, it gets me so emotional to think about it. But I remember I asked one of the high schoolers and I go, what do you make of this? And they're like, well, it's a show about a girl with magical powers and a nine year old raised her hand. And she said, it's about a child who's not wanted. 
And like I have goosebumps right now hearing it. It's like you get it, you know. It, it's and it's a and somebody else was like, it's a an, another young kid was like, it's about circumstance and what do we do with, you know, how to and. And I guess to piggyback off your answer, that's where I kind of, with with mediumship, I, I have to say, especially when I get into the psychic territory, I have to go, look, like, the universe is not just magically going to fix your problems. And a psychic, yeah. if, if we go, oh, by December, it doesn't mean that by December it unfolded on its, it means you had to bust your ass and like you have to do the growth factor, you have to do the forgiveness, you have to do the the higher road because most likely the, the person that you're grappling with is not going to do it. And it's it is nobody but me is going to tell my story. Is not is what she says in Naughty. I know. And my absolute favorite moment of Matilda, which I don't think I've ever ever said to anybody. You heard it is, here first. I know it's my favorite moment of the entire show, and I would. Um, I'm going, I, I've exited up the aisle, but I would turn around every night is when she is saying goodbye to Mr. Wormwood and she puts out her hand and he shakes it. Mm. And then, then the spell is broken and he can take his hat off. My favorite moment, because she is the one who goes, this is okay. You're not deciding whether I'm going to be happy and you did the best that you could. We're going to shake on it. There's no hard feelings. And it is the most incredible it's that and the first time she hugs him was honey, I love. But but for me, it was when she's saying goodbye to Mr. Wormwood. It just is such a metaphor for children, adults. And that song, Naughty, it is like, you are in charge. You can choose to be, ups- if you had a bad parent, you can choose to be upset about that for the rest of your life or you can shake their hand, whatever metaphorical way you want to do that yes. and say, okay, moving on. And it's so powerful for an eight-year-old to teach that lesson. And every, I would look at it every night. I just, it was my favorite thing. There were so many moments in that show where yeah. I remember the first one that like literally I felt like I was kicked in the gut was when she says, you know, I haven't been able to advance you into the next class, but here are these books. How does that sound? And the pause and the oh, bear hug. Uh, you could energetically feel that whole theater just because uh, I think, and I don't mean it rudely, Matilda is such a quirky show in the fact that it's it's a it's a British production. And I remember seeing the end of Act One. Your Americans are so used to expecting this big razzle dazzle, and she just goes, That's yeah. not right. Ba 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 and like black and you're like, what the? Uh-huh. And I think that hug is that first moment where like we all kind of soften as an audience and we're like, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've thought about it so much. And, um, you know, I, I think as a medium, it's, it's tough because there are moments where I have read the Miss Honeys. There, there are these moments where the apology comes through from the soul. And then, but you look at these and the resilience of, of the person that I'm reading in the fit. And they're like, I didn't want that to be my lot in life and, and hold this again. Like it's, it's so inspiring. So I think sometimes I learn more as the medium from just sitting in the presence of like, these are, I know it sounds silly. These are like real life heroes to me. The the fact that something that awful happened to you and you can just go like, I forgive them. And it's not my story. Uh, Somebody had asked a fascinating question in a show like Matilda, where your character doesn't really undergo any growth. Do you as an actor then, is it hard to undergo growth as an actor if your character isn't every night? Yeah, it's difficult. That that to me was the hardest thing. You know, Mr. Wormwood has closure. Mrs. Wormwood does not. And so to play an absolutely horrible person from, from start to finish, what I had to do was find the redeeming qualities in her. And I grew to love this horrible person because you have to find yeah. fun things about them. And what I what I loved about her are things that I wish I had in my own life, how unapologetic she is, how she gives no fucks what no. anybody thinks of her. And that's an incredible quality. And I play a lot of characters like that. And I just wish I had a little more and I do have a lot of that in my own life, but I, I tend to take it from these characters where if they don't have growth, you have to find 
you have to be okay with who they are. And it's such a, like, it was a great metaphor for me in being okay with who I was, because it, it you know, loud is, is all about, loud, loud is strange because it works so well in Britain because it is making fun of Americans <laughs> and how loud we are. And it doesn't play as well in, in the States because we're so used to people like that. Like that's everywhere. So it was difficult for me to kind of find a way in and, and make this person human and not make her a cartoon, which is what our amazing directors were so uh, afraid of, mm -hmm. is, is you can't make them cartoons, they have to be real people. But yeah, having not having growth, you just have to, to find a way into being uh, okay with who they are. If you don't have growth in a character, you, you've got to love them from the second you step on stage. And that's the, and for people playing Mrs. Wormwood, anyone listening to this, that's the big, pro, that's the big issue. You cannot hate these people. You can hate them, but you have to, you have to love to hate them. And that's why I love villains because they are completely flawed. But most villains completely 100% believe in everything that they say and do. Yeah. You may not agree with it, but if you're playing someone, especially a funny villain, the audience can't hate you or you're doomed. Like there has to be something that you love about this character that comes through. It's also interesting. I know we spoke about bootlegs. When the show was bootlegged so heavily, was it mostly by children? Um, here's the thing. For some reason, I've gotten this reputation of that I'm so anti-bootleg. And, and that's, it's, this is not true. I don't like bootlegs. I will say that. I don't like bootlegs because I think it takes creativity out of the person watching it. If they are auditioning for something, if they are, are directing something and you take some a piece of, of, of someone else's work and you copy it, that's not your own creativity. You can take some of it, sure, steal from the best. Just don't carbon copy. So that is my take on the bootlegs. When we were being bootlegged at Matilda, and I think this is why people think I hate them. What was happening was it wasn't children bootlegging. I would say like late teens. Teens were bootlegging or sure. early 20s, whatever. What was happening is they were bootlegging it and then comparing our kids, comparing the Matildas, comparing the other kids. I am I'm so anti-message boards and uh, even these TikTok videos comparing people's performances because that does nothing. If you have a favorite Elphaba, fantastic. I don't need a three minute video describing why one is flat and one is not. It's, it's such a, a, a terrible way to come at art. Yes. And, and nothing will grow that way. So when they started doing it with our kids, I went mama bear. And, and if I saw somebody filming, I was the one that was like, cut, shut it down, shut it down. So I think that's where that came from. And if that's where that came from, then so be it. Yeah. But I don't like bootlegs for the comparison reason. I think is, is if you're seeing, my dog is whimpering. Hi, baby. If, if you see it because you have no other way to get to see a Broadway show, great. I don't care. Sure. Watch it, love it. It's not going to be the same. You know, my, my father never saw Matilda. He passed away while I was doing it. And he never saw it because he didn't want to see a bootleg. He was like, no, if I was going to see you on Broadway, I'll see you on Broadway, not yeah. a tape of you on Broadway. And that to him was like devaluing it. And I really kind of respected that. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, uh, you know, I love that there's video out there of the shows. I love it now, it was, especially now that the things have closed. Like, I love it. It's, it's the um, pitting Yes. Performances against each other, which I think is so uh, harmful to growth in someone's art, or it just creates a really crappy. But the creativity thing is huge, though, too, because when when we, I will I will be the first to admit when the when I grow up sequence came about and I'm started to block it. So first off, if you're at home and you want to license this production with your product, whatever company. Technically, on paper, you are not allowed to use the swings, um, which I don't know if you know. It's, know it's, no, I didn't um, know RSC that. does not allow it. So, wow. um, which yeah. is not stopping these illegal productions in like Brazil. But um, I was like, you know what? I, I was like, I sat down and I'm like, this, 
I looked at the script again. I'm, I did a deep dive and I'm like, okay, script wise, I can't change the fact that they're, I, I want to keep the fact that they're in a playground, that they're in a respite. So I was like, you know what, let's just do, I, I was very fortunate where we had these two beautiful slides that were donated, like huge oh. slides. So oh. we had them come out and then I will never forget this moment. I, I did it as a mock in rehearsal and I brought in a couple people just to watch them watch it. And we had a young kid come down from stage right and an older kid, like the who they grew up to be, come down from stage yeah. left and they would meet. And oh. at one point, I was like, I really want to try to honor someone else's story that might not be visible because we're seeing a girl come down the side and an adult girl the other. So I told my kids this idea. I was like, I don't know if you guys want to go with me on this journey for a second. And I was like, what about people that don't feel represented during this moment? And what if we don't feel comfortable in our skin? And so this little 10 year old was like, I really want to do this. So she goes down the slide and you can see that she's like fidgeting with her uniform and the fact that she doesn't feel comfortable. And a boy, um, a male comes down the, the other slide and they, they go up to each other. It was really, the lighting was beautiful. There was like fog it and cause it looked like otherworldly and, you know, they do the replicated movements and she looks cause she's very confused and she was sitting at the base of the slide and he comes up and, you know, she puts her chin up and she does this kind of like, is this who I become? And he nods and she bear hugs and watching. And that's what you will not get from recreating a bootleg. Like totally. that, that might've that might been that moment that somebody went, that was the coolest part of the show. For me, that that that's the whole bootleg thing. But I I don't have a problem with them. I just have a problem with stealing somebody's. <laughs> I have a problem with the like... unauthorized productions too, because then we're literally stealing royalties away from, <laughs> you know, like we were talking about this one production that I saw was, I think my favorite too is when Matildas are like eighteen, and we were saying it last time. They're like, when I grow up, I was like, bitch, you grown at this you point. Like, you you did grow up, honey child. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Matilda's like 20 and she's like moving the chalk. And I'm like, this is bone chilling. But I love that with the digital ones, there's no chalk. So just the messages like are scrawled out with like nothing. Oh, you're kidding. I'm like, this is <gasps> creepy as hell. I didn't see the show until I was out of it. Really? And then went back to close it. And then I said, you guys, I, I've actually never seen it. And they got me a ticket and I saw Amy Spanger who, who had replaced me and she's amazing. Terrific. And, but I, I texted Tim and at intermission, I was fucking wreck. Like I was always a wreck in the show. I knew how amazing it was, but sitting there and watching it objectively, I was, I don't think I'll ever have another, it was that feeling you get in a theater where something just affects you so much. And yes, there was the aspect of how proud I am to have been a part of this and to get to be a part of this. But it was just one of those shows where I just, there's so many moments that just hit me and yeah, I, it was an incredible moment for me to, to see it as a, an audience member. I didn't know the song quiet as well. And I would oh. usually skip it. And then I was in rehearsal and My I always, song. my note too. I started weeping in rehearsal because as a medium, what she is describing in the beginning when it's in what six, when it's like, um, yes. before we get into the quiet segment, her talking about everything being incredibly loud and yeah it it's truly like with the gallery readings last night it they were at 6 30 this started at 10 a.m and it w- was pressure it hurt hubbub and then when you hear it it just stop and she just goes quiet like uh, when she says selling uh, i view it for me as a medium like for me to really do my job the best I am in the eye of the storm and everything is going on around me and I just pull it out and I read what I'm getting. And so to see Tim Minchin's depth of such a, I don't even know how to describe the way that song hits me. Um, it, it will come on, you know, on, on shuffle and I'm like, it's, it's so gorgeous. So, um, it's my favorite song of the whole show. Mm. And I, uh, very often would sit in the pit for it because I wasn't on stage. And to hear that violin and to hear these incredible musicians play it was absolutely stunning. And it, yeah, it was my, my favorite, my favorite wow. song show. I think it's, it's, 
And then of course there's a sense of pride saying my little nine and 10 year olds just command an entire Broadway audience standing on a stack of books is, is so powerful. Yes. And, and it just like, uh, yeah, it, it's it, my favorite, my favorite, favorite song. And Tim, you know, I don't know how he feels about mediumship, but he's, I would argue, pro, I, I don't know that I'll work with anyone that brilliant again. I mean, I, I think he is unbelievable. I, you know, I, I, when I met him, he had time for one audition in Los Angeles. He was shooting a television show and he had time to see one audition and it was mine because I had been flying out to New York and they had me coming in. Uh, they said, Can you come? they're seeing some like celebrity trench bowls in LA and we know that you live in LA. Can, can, can you come in one more time? And this had been six months of auditions and Tim was there and immediately I, was, I felt at ease. He was, I, I was like, oh, well, this is a person Go, you know, going back to the universe, I'm like, this is somebody I'm supposed to be friends with, I'm supposed to know. And later on, he told me, he goes, I only had time to see one audition, it was yours. <laughs> and it was like crazy that it was just- That's wild. Was that way, yeah. It, but it, it, but it, oh, I'm letting my dog in. But sure. also like not crazy, because it is how it's supposed to be. You know, it's how it's supposed to go. Well, if you're listening at home, I guess to, to hop back on the, the mediumship train or um, Matilda in the musical obviously has the power to manifest things. So it's a it's a topic <laughs> yeah. that fascinates me because I'm asked a lot too, like what do I think what do I think like manifestation is? Because so if, if you're listening years ago that book came out like the secret, and it's not mm-hmm. really a secret. It's literally just like positive thinking manifests, like mm-hmm. like attracts like. So but it's also interesting, though, too, because I also believe that manifestation doesn't mean it just happens to you because you, me personally, I believe manifestation is I am believing in myself enough so that way a door will open for the opportunity for me to work my ass off and get what I want. It's not just, and I think that's where people go wrong with manifestation. It's this, I'm going to manifest that I, I get this job, and I'm like, your resume is awful right now. I manifested Matilda. Did you? Um, I had, yeah, uh, and I've never, um, yeah, I, for the entire six months that I was auditioning, I had a bulletin board by my bedside and there was a picture of the Mrs. Wormwood from London and I had a push pin through her face <laughs> um, because I didn't want to see her face. I wanted to imagine mine. Yeah. And I still have that billboard. I 100% manifested that. And I, it, it, it literally, it was eight months from when I auditioned to when I found out it was happening. And I never once wavered. I was like, I'm getting this, I'm getting this. And every night I'd go to sleep looking at that picture and every morning I'd wake up. But for me, and I'm a huge believer in, in uh, manifestation, but it, for me, it's intention. It is not, I'm, I'm wishing this will happen and it will happen. It's not that at all. It is what do you want? Be clear about what you want and then work your ass off. Bingo. But be open to it. I um, I started all the manifesting stuff way, way before The Secret came out. It was, um, someone gave me a book by Florence Scovel Shin who started all this stuff in the thirties. And, and a lot of it resonated with me. A lot of it didn't, but, but it kind of got me on the path of, of um, intention. And basically what the secret is, is just, you know, uh, look for the good. Look, and, and I'm a, a big fan of Abraham Hicks and like, uh, you know, all these people who teach, yes. um, teach this. And it, it you can call it hokey or hippie or whatever for me. And it's a, an ongoing practice with me because I can go dark so quickly. So the only thing that I can do is try and change my thought and try and, and, and see the good in something. And, and I think that's all it is, is if you are seeing the positive or seeing the possibility of things, you're going to be more open and you'll see the nuggets of things that are coming through, like the, oh my God, whoa, oh, I made a little progress here where you wouldn't, when I'm in a really dark mood and I'm down on myself, I don't see the little nuggets of progress. Yeah. And so I think that's all it is. People can be like, oh, it doesn't work. That's fine. That's whatever works for you. But, but setting your intention and it's very funny because the choreographers of Matilda, intention is their number one word and every movement has an intention. 
And I remember taking that into my life of like everything I say, everything I do has to have this intention. Yes. And if you're cognizant of what you're saying and what you're thinking about yourself, it really does make a difference. And like I said, though, it is difficult. There are days I wake up and it's been rough. I've had a, a rough couple, you know, just the pandemic, I think has messed with everybody. And it, but sorry, going back to the manifesting, no, of course. I hundred percent do it. I a hundred percent believe in it. And, uh, I, I believe that complaining about something makes it worse. I believe that complaining about things manifest in your health. And, and yeah, yeah. I, I 100% subscribe to that. And from the mediumship perspective, I will tell you, if you are somebody that's like, hmm, I'm never going to gain that. I'm never going to weigh that. Look, I, I mean, and not to be rude, but I've heard people look at that cow. I will never weigh that. They gained that weight during the pandemic. Or yep. I will never, because what, from my perspective, I see what the universe or what spirit will do is, oh, really? You up for a challenge, bitch? And then they yep. will throw it in your lap to be like, no, we're going to make this a learning opportunity for you. Two years ago, I did a reading um, for five people and all of them were deaf and they had hired an interpreter. And to this day, it is one of the most profound memories I will ever have uh, because I all of a sudden had to become so acutely aware of my language, what I was saying. There could, and not, now I am not somebody that gives, I'm very proud of the fact that I do not give wishy washy messages ever. It's not, it could be this, could be this, could be. But to know that I then had an interpreter who would really need to like trim the fat anyway. And then to see this moment of like, because once my words were done, they would finish. And to then be able to just step back and watch the client like receive the message, it was the, one of the most magical experiences of my life. I'd love to talk about your reading. So this one was interesting in the fact that you just, if, for folks listening at home, what a boss like ass feeling it is to just have Leslie Margarita DM you and be like, hey, <laughs> I want a reading. Can you read me? Because... I think I had just put out Stephanie J. Block's episode. And yeah. I, get and I this, watched it. I loved it. Oh, thank you. I got this DM and I'm like, ooh, yes, we will yeah. we will make this happen. And um, I was just so excited to go into yours. So is there anything that, because you had never been read before, you said, or at least not by anyone legit versus sketchy not or legit. something. I had been to like psychics. I'm, I'm making mm. quotation marks, you know, um, and I love Stephanie Block. So I, I watched your interview and and I had been so my my soul was so restless and I kept getting weird, not weird, nothing's weird, but signs sure. from whatever. And I was like, something is going on. So I was like scrolling through my Instagram and I was like, oh my God, oh, this is why. This is why. Immediately I DM'd you and I was like, you don't know me. I swear I'm a legit person. <laughs> like, uh, I would love to be read. And so I, I was, yeah, I was so, so excited. And I, after we did our reading, I just felt so much more at ease. It felt like some, it felt like somebody was trying to get my attention. And then you showed up on my Instagram and I was like, here's a way to figure out who needs to get my attention. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it was, Anything that, you, gosh, whatever you feel comfortable sharing from our time together. Well, I mean, the, the, the huge one is I knew, I feel my dad's presence. My dad passed away uh, six years ago while I was doing Matilda. And I was the only one that wasn't there. I, every, all of my, my three sisters and my, my mom are in California and I was in New York. And he, had, he got sick very quickly. Um, within like a week and I, I I kept saying do I need to come home do I need to come home and he was the one saying do not come home do not come home because his biggest pride for my life was that I was living my dream which is what he wanted me to do and he did not want me to miss shows because I don't miss shows <laughs> I try not to I'm very old school that way he didn't want me to miss shows he didn't want me to worry and I remember the day that he died I had a put-in rehearsal for Matilda, um, like an understudy rehearsal. 
and I had decided not to fly up. I was going to fly up that morning. And I was like, he doesn't just doesn't want me there. And, and um, uh, I had a break in the put in rehearsal and I, I was on the phone and my sister put the phone up to him and I sang to him and he was already, you know, uh, unconscious. But when I started singing to him, he, uh, his eyes were fluttering and I clearly knew that he knew I was there and, and, and he passed and I left and I did the show that night. I went home, had some dinner, did the oh show gosh. that night because I knew that he wanted me to do the show. And two things happened. My, one of my um, stage hands who, you know, they become like family, these guys, right before I made my entrance, he put his hand on me and said, you know, my father died while I was working at the Schubert as well. And that was like such a comforting, everyone goes through this oh my gosh. type of thing. And then I was also doing at that time for BCEFA, it's this thing called the Red Bucket, where yeah. you do a, a speech after the show and you ask for donations. Well, I'm always the one who does the speech because I love it and I love that organization. And the show ended and I realized I had to, had to do this speech. But I was doing this speech the night my father died and I swear to you, and people might think this is weird. I looked out and in the center, center orchestra was a man in all white. And I swear to you, it was my father. Yep because he wasn't there when I looked again. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> and I don't tell people that because people go, oh, that's weird, whatever. But I had such a, um, I did not feel guilty not being there because I knew that's what he wanted. But when we were doing our reading, I knew, I was like, I know that he has messages for me because I often feel someone's hand on my shoulder. I often see, you know, the little signs of things. And what I wanted the most is what you came out with. I wanted to know that my, my first dog, which was his namesake, Bob Barker, Bob, uh, I wanted to know that they were together because they had such a, an amazing relationship. And that was you, you, without me <laughs> saying anything, you said the dog won't shut up. The dog is with me. Yeah. And I lost it. And that was the most incredible. Uh, and I shared it with my sisters and my mom. And it was such a, like, a. Uh, uh, this gave me some peace that the two things that I loved so much that had loved each other were together. And, and it was, it was just, um, yeah, I, you know, so much came through in that, that gave me peace. It's interesting too. You mentioned, you mentioned the pet. Sometimes somebody will go, I feel like you bring up dogs a lot. Yes. Because we have two dogs at home and they are our children. So you have to understand from my perspective, we see in a reading as the medium the things that are closest to us because i know if i were to go to a medium if i ever lost one of my my babies i would want them to come through first probably before human family and yes. so i keep my eyes to the ground and when this dog would not stop i'm like i have to identify this and i think the thing that stood out to me about our time together was i kept going I'm hearing the song, My House, from Matilda, the bridge part. But I'm like, it's weird because that's not your song in the show. But literally just the part for, what is it, for this is my house, like over. Yep. And, like that was on loop. And then, spoiler alert, like. So, yeah. I When we did our reading, I was in my childhood home that my father designed and built. He was a, he was a, a mason. He built the house. It was literally his house. That's crazy. <laughs> and so to have my house and to have him come through so much and, and, and to be in his physical, my house was, was crazy and, and made so much sense. Like it just, and then the boots, yeah, it, it was nuts. Do you remember the boots? And then the what? The boots on the oh way gosh. out. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I haven't nuts. even told you this. I can't even tell you. Okay. So you told me that he was like, don't forget the shoes. Don't forget the shoes. And you were seeing like a, like a winter kind of like a boot, like yes. a heavy with fur. My husband, before I went to visit my mom and my sisters told me, will you please grab your dad had given me these Ugg slippers, these like heavy, like winter <laughs> slippers. And I had taken them out of my closet and put them like where I could see them where I wouldn't leave. So you said, he was like, don't forget the shoes. And I was like, they're right here. I got them. I already got them. I had the wrong shoes. I got, I brought them home. And my husband goes, those aren't the shoes. And I was like, oh my God, my father was telling me they were the wrong ones. 
Shut up. Like, yeah. I mean, because yeah, even that, even that, that on its that own was wild that he was talking about the shoes that were out of frame. But these to me were like, because I remember I was like, well, you're in L.A. I'm like, the weather is hot over there probably. And they're like, like these heavy Ugg slippers and I got the wrong ones. And literally I was like, I, okay, yeah, I got the right here. It's like, he was like, don't forget them. I'm like, I got them. I already got the wrong ones. And that is, I mean, I always say though, that's the that's the crazy type of evidential stuff that will happen in a reading where like, because I, I sometimes am asked too, like, well, not asked, it's kind of told to me, which kind of offends me. They're like, well, you could Google these celebrities. And I'm like, you cannot Google things like my house. You cannot Google things like the boots, the dog. It was a real honor to to bring him through. And I saw after a while, oh, when I you. followed you, I looked at the photo and I was like, this is exactly like what that energy felt like in my presence. It just felt like you know, and he did talk about, he was like, I didn't want you to miss the show because he was yes. like, your star yeah. was on the rise. And yeah. believe it or not, one of my symbols is the Matilda, the escapologist and the, when the hands miss and they start oh. doing this, that's my symbol for somebody could not be there. So I saw yeah. it and, um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was a real, it was a real gift to, to get to to spend time with you and, 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 and bring him through. So thank you. If you were a ghost, while I don't believe it, if you were a ghost stuck in a theater and could only watch the same musical over and over, what would it be? Oh my gosh. I love dream girls so much. Somebody else said dream girls. I love it. I, it's just like, it has everything, the spectacle, the drama, the family aspect. I don't know. I, I mean, it might be that one. Cause that has like such feel good things, you know? And yeah, I, I maybe that one. Any character that you've played that would benefit most from a medium or a reading? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, the character I played Zorro, Inez, who passed away in the show. Um, she was a gypsy queen and she had um, qualities of a medium and she could see things and she could feel them. And so I, I feel like she would benefit from, because she does so much for other people about their energy and feeling them. And then I feel like it would be cool for her to see who she's helped and who, you know, yeah. that would be cool. Hundreds of years from now, when we're all no longer here, how would you want folks to look back and remember Leslie? Such a good question. I've, and honestly, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, lately, is, is uh, my mark and, and my imprint on my business. I, I really do think I would want people to look back on me and not only think I was a kind person, but I, I, I truly hope that people look back and, and that I've made any kind of mark on my industry that I've, that I've no matter how big or small it is, I, it's been important for me to, to change the molecules, change the energy, even for a little bit, you know, like I just, I, I just want to be somebody who made it a little better in any way for somebody, for one person, for 20 people. Sure. Um, I think that's the most important. Well, I want to thank you so much for being my special guest. I will, oh, I, I will remember this for quite some time. So thank you. Thank um, you. Thank everyone you. at home, I'll, I'll put up Leslie's information so you can learn more about her and all the great things that she has done and continues to do. And uh, again, Leslie, be well, <laughs> everyone at home, be well, and I will see you next week on Stage Storm Medium. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.